Our scripture reading this morning is from Daniel 3, 12 through 30. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell, bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies, rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is God's word. Three men from Israel stand firm in their resolve not to bow down to a massive image based on a surpassing allegiance to God. The the required action seemed so small, just bow down. The cost so high, but they do not flinch. How did they do that? Well, first we're going to answer six context questions to just kind of get our frame of reference, and then we're going to drill down and discover what it is, what is it about these three guys that renders them capable of doing this? So the six context questions we're going to ask are, who is here? What kind of image is this? Why is Nebuchadnezzar doing this? What kind of furnace is this? Where's Daniel? And who is the fourth man? And then we'll drill down and ask how do they do that so let's start with the first one who is here satraps would be the chief representatives of the king think of them as kind of like the cabinet prefects uh, are military commanders governors would be district uh, level leaders advisors would be counselors people that he talks to treasurers you know what those are judges and magistrates. It's basically everybody who's in a position of power and authority, and it says of the provinces, meaning from the entire empire. So basically this gathering that Nebuchadnezzar convenes is a made-for-TV Olympics opening ceremony. Now, or you can think of a Super Bowl. I like to call it, since they're on the plane of Dura, the Dura Bowl. So imagine this, if you will. Here is 
the entire well-organized bureaucracy, everybody is here who's anybody in power, the entire empire is represented, so it's empire-wide attendance, different language groups are represented, attendance is in the hundreds, perhaps thousands, and on top of that, the national orchestra is there, and I don't know what those instruments are, we don't really have a way to reconstruct that. We can ask Daniel and his friends about it when we get to heaven, because what kind of orchestra was that? But whatever this is, something big is going on. Now, I'm going to show you something that's a behind-the-scenes look. There's actually something else going on. There's a possible parallel account that's very intriguing, and certain scholars have actually identified, you know what, this is happening at the same time. So let's see something else that's going on that helps us to understand why this durable is being convened. This is from Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 59. And it says this, the message which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah the son of Neriah, the grandson of Messiah, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. Now Sariah was quartermaster. Now don't get hung up on all the names there. Basically, this is telling us and they pinpoint when it was. This is something that happened in 594 or 593 BC with Zedekiah, who was the last ruler or the last king of Israel or Judah in the south. And uh, Baruch is a uh, scribe for Jeremiah, who's a prophet at this time in Judah, Jerusalem. And Sariah is his brother. And Sariah goes along with Zedekiah when he is called to Babylon. And Sariah, brother of Baruch, has a message from Jeremiah. There was apparently an attempted revolt in Babylon in 595 BC, so that would be two years before this. So in 594, Nebuchadnezzar summoned everyone to Babylon for a kind of loyalty test because he's saying we're not doing this rebellion thing and so he brings everybody and so the convocation in the plain of Dura which is Daniel 3 may well be a loyalty test used with all including Zedekiah the king of Judah who is summoned to come and with him in his entourage is someone who's a brother of Baruch and he actually has a message that he's bringing with him. And, and if you want to look for more detail, go to Jeremiah 50 and 51. Don't do that right now. I'll read you the relevant section, okay? So from this passage, Jeremiah says a whole bunch of things in Jeremiah 50 and 51 and they're not favorable toward Babylon. And then when he's finished saying those things, and they were all written in a scroll, it says, so Jeremiah wrote in a single scroll all the calamity which would come upon Babylon. That is, all these words which have been written concerning Babylon, which is Jeremiah 50 and 51. Then Jeremiah said to Sariah, as soon as you come to Babylon, then see that you read all these words aloud. So Sariah, Baruch's brother, is coming with Zedekiah, and when he arrives in Babylon, he's to go into the main drag, I don't know what that would be, go on Poplar Avenue, and uh, maybe Poplar and, uh, you know, I don't know, Perkins or something like that, and you're supposed to read Jeremiah 50 and 51 out loud, which, by the way, is not a good message for Babylon. Then Jeremiah said to Sariah, as soon as you come to Babylon, then see that you read all these words aloud and say, you, O Lord, have promised concerning this place to cut it off so that there will be nothing dwelling in it, whether man or beast, but it will be a perpetual desolation. And as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will tie a stone to it and throw it in the middle of the Euphrates and say, just so shall Babylon sink down and not rise again because of the calamity that I'm going to bring upon her, and they will become exhausted. And so it's highly likely, I can't say this with absolute certainty, but it is highly likely that Zedekiah with Sariah came to Babylon after the attempted revolt in 595 and came there because 
Nebuchadnezzar was convening everyone because he wanted to assert his authority, both religious and political. And at the same time that he's doing that, Jeremiah has given a message that basically says, Babylon, it won't end well for you. I, the God of all things, have spoken. So at the time of this drama at Dura, Jeremiah's prophecy against Babylon is echoing in the streets on Poplar, affirming that Babylon is accountable to God. Now, Hezekiah struggled with this, one of the prophets. You're going to use Babylon as an instrument of judgment? Because Jerusalem has not fallen yet. That's yet to come in about eight or nine years. You're going to use Babylon? And he says to Hezekiah, yes. But Hezekiah is going to be responsible for their actions. Babylon took on God when they decided to destroy Jerusalem. And they were doing what God had de deemed necessary. But they will be judged for it. Now this is nothing new. Listen to this, Luke 22:22. 22, 22. For indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. In other words, Jesus is going to the cross and God decided that long ago. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. That's Judas. So at the same time as Nebuchadnezzar is convening this massive empire-wide celebration of his supremacy, the God of all kingdoms is saying, Babylon, you are accountable to me. And now we're coming to the counterpoint that is going to occur associated with this image. Now, what kind of image is this? Uh, it's about 90 feet tall. It's about nine feet wide, which is a one to 10 ratio. The human body is more of a one to five, you know, about five feet tall and about a foot wide. So it's not a realistic image unless it had a big pedestal to it. It's a gold image. It's probably not solid gold. Uh, there probably is not enough gold that has ever been mined to create a solid gold statue of that size. But gold plating could be substantial. For example, if you look at the, uh, the coffin of King Tut, there's about 1.5 tons of gold that were used for that. So there could be pretty substantial gold plating on this. It could be an image of Nebuchadnezzar, who looks taller and thinner, I guess. Or it could be a deified image of Nebuchadnezzar. Or perhaps this is an image of a god like Nabu, who uh, he was the god of, his name means speaking, which is basically a way of saying, I do the talking, you do the listening. So it, it could be that, we don't really know. Why is Nebuchadnezzar doing this? Whether you make the Jeremiah connection or not, political unity is often bolstered through religious unity. And in light of recent events, this is something that makes a lot of sense. He's conquered a number of people, and he's asking them to swear allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar and to do so before this image, which is a way of saying, and I swear allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar, and God have wrath on me if I break it. Uh, the threat suggests that he anticipates some resistance. You know, anybody who doesn't do this, you're going in the fiery furnace. Well, you wouldn't make a threat like that unless you were concerned about what would happen. Uh, here's an interesting statement. This is from uh, Dwight Pentecost. He says, Nebuchadnezzar purposed to establish a unified government and also a unified religion. The king constituted himself as both head of state and head of religion, and all who served under him were to recognize both his political and religious authority. In other words, he's establishing himself as both king and God, is what's going on. And Nebuchadnezzar can't think of any reason for someone to not bow down other than insubordination. There's no way to explain it. Now, the language in verse 7, which uh, Catherine did not read that because it was a long chapter. But in verse 7, it actually says literally, as soon as they were hearing, they all fall down, fell down. 
In other words, the minute the band started, they weren't even through the first measure and everybody's down on the ground. <laughs> this is clearly both a loyalty test toward Nebuchadnezzar and a loyalty test towards his gods. These men, some detractors say, O king, have disregarded you and they do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. In other words, they are disrespecting you and they are dis disrespecting your religion and your God. Nebuchadnezzar has come to see himself as the supreme head of the Babylonian pantheon. I'm, I'm number one. He, in fact, he actually says this in verse 15. What God is there that who can deliver you out of my hands? I'm bigger than God. Nebuchadnezzar seeks to compel everyone to worship him and serve him as one greater than all gods. Basically, his core plan is, I am all for, this is Nebuchadnezzar talking, I am here to promote unity. And the way we're going to do that is anybody who disagrees with me is going to die. Because we are going to have some serious unity here. And that's, that's what he's doing. Now, what kind of furnace is this? Uh, probably the best way to think of it would be, think of a, a railway tunnel in which one end is blocked and there's an opening above and a great work below where a bellows where air can be pushed into that thing. So you can take someone up to, up to the top and throw them in, but you can see what's going on from this open end and then the air is used to uh, heat up the fire to increase the rate of combustion. Uh, one estimate of what the heat could be is around 900 to 1,000 degrees centigrade, which would be about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is very hot. By the way, Neb seems to like his fires. This is not the first instance. For example, in Jeremiah 29:22, there's actually a curse that was used in, amongst the uh, Israelites in which they said, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. So apparently this is not his first time using a fire to promote allegiance. Where's Daniel? Don't know. But Daniel was saved from the fire. See, I'm going to show you someone who is saved through the fire. But Daniel, we don't know why. Maybe he was somewhere else in the country. Can't say. But he was not on the scene. Who is the fourth man? Also unknown. Uh, it could be an angel. It could be a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. But there's nothing in the text that makes it clear. But clearly this is an emissary from God. If not, Jesus Okay, that's some background. Now what I want to do is zero in on three people or three groups of people. First are the opportunists. It says there are certain Jews, this is them talking, whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you've set up. Now the guys who are talking here are also leaders. They are peers of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. By the way, these men were saved by Daniel in chapter, and his three friends, in chapter 2. When Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill everyone if they didn't tell him his dream and interpret it. So these are the same guys who owe their lives to Daniel and his three friends. But I guess that's the way of ambition, isn't it? They see an opportunity. They're not even Babylonians. They've been promoted. <laughs> but they really don't have your best interest at heart, king. Clearly, they resented Daniel and his friends who were promoted above them. And they see in this a window of opportunity. We can get rid of them and get back to the way things were. They tell one lie and two truths. 
For example, they say they have not worshipped the image. Well, that's true. But they say they have disregarded you. They have not done anything to communicate dishonor or disrespect toward Nebuchadnezzar. There's a little bit of blame casting here. They say, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you appointed. <laughs> kind of like, I don't know what you were thinking there, King Z, but what are you doing that? The text doesn't say so, but they must have relished it when Nebuchadnezzar went into a rage. They must have been going, <laughs> oh, this is great. They're going in the furnace. We're getting back to where we want things to be. By seeking the demotion of men dedicated to God, they actually facilitated these very men's promotion. Didn't work out the way they thought, did it? Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who is against us? For those who love God alone, God is perfectly capable of working our good, even through the efforts of those who seek our harm. I love this picture. Every dart that Satan throws hits God's target. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine. He's still throwing darts. But every time he throws a dart at us, he hits God's target. God is not up in heaven going, oh no, what Satan has done. What am I going to do? If God is for us, who is against us? Answer, no one can work our harm. Look at the opportunists and Daniel's three friends. They thought this was going to be their victory lap and that the music was going to be a reason for dancing. When in point of fact, what they did is simply facilitated God's blazing, and I realize that's dad humor, but blazing demonstration of who is really in charge. Well, let's look at the ultimate narcissist. That's Nebuchadnezzar. He says, no God can deliver. I'm bigger than God. <laughs> we can, you know, say... Nev, what are you thinking? But are there not times when we think we can beat the system where we believe lies? I can do what I want and not what God wants and it'll work out. I'm the exception. Well, the reply of these three friends makes Nebuchadnezzar go ballistic. He is filled, it says he was filled with wrath and his countenance changed. It's just like something washed over him and all you saw was hatred and rage and anger. And so he embraces three measures that are designed to ensure there is no way they are not going to feel the brunt of my wrath. And so he has several valiant warriors. So he gets some of his top military guys and they tie them up. They're bound with cords and the heat is raised. Now, I don't know if seven times represents a, a kind of an idiom. In other words, he said, you know, raise it seven times, meaning, you know, turn the, turn the dial on the blowers to 10 or something like that. Because I don't know that it became like 7,000 degrees centigrade instead of 1,000 degrees centigrade. But it was, real, it was as hot as they could make it. What's he going to... What's his point? I'm going to prove that defiance will be decisively crushed and his point will be made. He loses some good men. You know, think of again this kind of railway tunnel and they go up to the top where there's an opening and the three men are going to bring or the, however men were necessary came and we're going to throw the, the guys into the furnace. The heat was so intense before they even get to the opening that they died and collapsed, but the three bodies rolled into the furnace, which is interesting, isn't it? I mean, God could have had them all die and then they rolled to safety, but instead they rolled right into the furnace. 
When you think you're bigger than God, get ready for a rude awakening. Because the point that he was going to make was not the point that God made. Now, Nebuchadnezzar does show us that there is hope even for a flaming egotist. I mean, here's what his response was in Daniel 3. He says, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command. He's actually commending them for defying him and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. I mean, it would have been possible for Nebuchadnezzar to see them in there, and he says, come out and grab a spear. I'm going to make this point, but he didn't do that. Which, by the way, tells us that even someone who is as far gone as a Nebuchadnezzar, while they are still drawing breath, it's not too late. Uh, think of this sequence, and I'm going to show you more of this uh, next week. But in chapter 2, after the dream reveal, here's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Surely your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords and a revealer of mysteries. So basically what he's saying is God is special. Your God is special. After the flames... He says, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego honors and delivers those who serve him alone. There's no other God who is able to deliver in this. So he's moved from God is special to your God is in a class by himself. Now, he's not saying, and he is my God. That's yet to come, but he's going to get there. But we're making progress, so this is good. I really want to zero in on three bold souls they say in verses 16 and 17, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the blazing furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I love what Wearsby says on this quote, so good. The three men could have compromised with the king and defended their disobedience by arguing, well, everybody else is doing it, or our office demands that we obey, or we'll bow our knees, but we won't bow our hearts. They might have said, we can do our people more good by being officers in the king's service than by being ashes in the king's furnace. <laughs> but then get this, but true faith doesn't look for loopholes. It simply obeys God and knows that he will do what is best. Faith rests on commands and promises. Now, there's things God has told us and things he tells us will happen, not on arguments and explanations. And that's what these three guys are doing. Now, there are four bedrock affirmations. This is really where they've planted their feet and there's no moving. Participation in idolatry is not an option. They understand the commandments. So they understand God alone. They also know God has the power to save. God is omnipotent. He's perfectly capable of saving us no matter what you do. No matter how hot you make the furnace, doesn't really matter. Number three, we do not presume he will. Even if he doesn't. Our allegiance is not going to change. And last one, we are prepared to die whether he saves us or not. This is not benefit-based belief. I love Jesus because of all the wonderful things he does for me. It is true that Jesus does amazing things, but that's not why. I'm not committed to him because of what I get out of it. I love him more than life itself and you can take away everything and I will still love him. That's what they're saying. This, by the way, is the mindset of someone we can call the overcomer. Uh, Leon Wood makes this and I, I realize I'm giving you several quotes but they're all so good. I just loved them and I couldn't let them go. First, the young men recognize that God's will might be different from what they would find pleasant. 
and they were willing to have it so without complaining. Second, they did not make their own obedience contingent upon God's doing that which was pleasant to them. In other words, they found their object of affection, affection in God himself, not in what God did for them. Do we love God because of who God is? Or do we love him because of good stuff he does for us? Well, God has a better idea. Being saved through the fire, that's the three friends, is way better than being saved from the fire. I'm glad when God rescues us and we don't even have to face something. But the fire actually became a means of blessing for them. Because of being saved through the fire, they have something to share to a captive audience. Here's all the bureaucrats. Everybody's here. The band. And they come out. And I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar had a speaker system or used a, mic a megaphone or what. But anyway, he's saying, their God is the real thing. And thousands are witnessing this. When, God's, when God means more than life itself, that's when we have something others want to understand. What is this? You know, I've introduced to you a couple of verses that we are using as a benediction. I want to explain one of them because it's very relevant to what we're looking at this morning. In 1 Peter 4, 14, it says, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of God and of glory rests on you. Let me explain that verse a minute, all right? So first, it says blessed. It uses makarios, the same word that Jesus uses in the uh, Beatitudes. It's basically a way of saying, if you are reviled for the name of God, for the name of Christ, way to go. Congratulations. And we don't normally think of it that way, do we? If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you know, we're going, oh, man, I'm standing with you, brother. We're praying. Oh, that must really hurt. And I'm not saying those are invalid things. But what God is saying is, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, congratulations. Really? Why? Oh, well, in this case, he actually tells us, it's in the because phrase, because, here's the reason why I'm congratulating you. He says, the Holy Spirit, who is God, and clothed in glory, will rest on you. Now, that word rest is the same word that in some places refers to refresh. It's almost like your spirit is refreshed, you're energized Basically, what he's saying is this in this verse. If you are reviled for your devotion to Jesus, who he is, what he's done, what he has said, you are to be congratulated. Here's why. You will actually experience the refreshing presence of the spirit of glory and of God. You will actually enjoy something of what Daniel's three friends experienced. Yeah. They experienced, I don't know if it's an angel or Jesus, but they experienced the presence of God manifested in whatever was happening. And this passage is saying, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, meaning someone is angry or do, working your harm because of who Jesus is or what he has said or what he has done as it has been expressed through your mouth, congratulations you are going to experience the presence of the Lord in a profound and powerful way that is echoed in what Daniel's three friends experienced. That's a promise to you. I, I told the, the guys uh, when we were meeting before the service to just kind of map it out, I said, now, on this sermon, I've actually uh, put two endings in it because I wasn't sure how much time I would have. But the bonus content is if we get to a good spot. So here we go into the bonus content. And they also said, well, maybe you should determine how many are sleeping. And I said, no, you're with me. We're, we're doing this. 
This, what I'm about to show you boggles my mind. I mean, if you take what I've told you already and then add this, I, I am stunned as I contemplate this. This idea of loving God alone, regardless of what you do to me, this is not an intellectual exercise. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, God alone. Yeah, okay, sounds good. On a date yet future, the very same thing that Daniel's three friends experienced is coming again. Listen to this passage, okay? This is Daniel 13, 15. And it was given to him, this is the false prophet, who is going to be the number, number one guy or the number two guy to the Antichrist. And it was given to him, the false prophet, to give breath to the image, which is a jar, giant statue of the beast, that's the Antichrist, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So at some point, yet future, I don't know when, there is going to be a massive statue that is erected. And apparently, somebody who is the false prophet, who's the number two guy to the Antichrist, is going to be capable of giving some AI to that image. It'll actually talk. And it will be capable of extinguishing anyone who does not worship it and the beast. This won't be a situation where you have an image and if you don't worship it, then you get thrown in the furnace. This will be one where if you do not pledge unqualified allegiance to the beast and to his image, you're gone. Will this happen in my lifetime? I don't know. Uh, if you're younger than me, which would be many of you, uh, will it happen in yours? It could be. Will it happen in the life of your children? It's possible. It could be your grandchildren. I don't know, you know, I don't have a chart where I can show you everything, you know, when everything's going to happen. I don't know that. But what I do know is that that passage is describing that is as certain as anything can be that is in the future for this planet. And those who are not capable of doing what Daniel's three friends did will die for the wrong reason. And those who refuse to worship the image of the beast will die for the right reason. A little earlier in Revelation it says this, and they overcame him, which is referring to the Antichrist. They defeated him. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And get this. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. In other words, they were Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednegoes. And their victory was their death for the right reason. Loving Jesus more than life itself is how they overcome what's coming. So here's my question to you and to me. Do you love Jesus more than life itself? That is the heart of the overcomer. And when Jesus sees that heart, yes, yes. That's what he's looking for in this room. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might strongly support those who, what? Whose hearts are completely his. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, congratulations. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now, it's possible in this room that there are some who would say, well, I don't love Jesus more than life. I'm not sure I even love Jesus. 
If you see what Jesus did on the cross for you, he actually came and died in your place because he loves you. How can you not love him back and say, I cannot believe that you love me enough to go to the cross in my place. I love you. And I love you more than life itself. Well, as I pray, I'm going to give an opportunity to you. If you have never embraced Jesus as the Lord whom you love, I will let you do that. And for the rest of us, I would say, let's use this as an opportunity to affirm, God, we love you more than life itself. But if there is anything in us that is less than that, show us that, that we might deal with it and be a people who are madly unqualifiedly in love with God. Let's pray. If you do not, cannot say, I love Jesus, then here is my prayer for you. Father, you know the heart condition of every person in this room. So I am pleading that you would show anyone in this room who does not love you who you are. That you would reveal to them who you are, all that you have already done, what was accomplished on the cross, and that their eyes would be opened and they would love you back. Father, for all of us in this room, we want to be people like Daniel's friends. We want to be those who love you more than life itself. If there's anything in us that is tugging at our heart, I pray that you'd show us that and that you would give us the strength to snip that cord and to love you 100% all in. We want to be a people who are known by this simple thing. We are willing to die because we love you more than life itself. Help us become that, even as we ask it in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior and whom we love. Amen.